look at that. Almost 25,000 subscribers, almost 2 million views. Wow. I'm getting close to painting class 300. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at Alexander Colville, or Alex Colville, and this painting, uh, Horse and Train, from 1954, one of the most iconic images in Canadian art history. A beautiful, poetic painting that has lots of different interpretations. People have written PhD and graduate theses about this painting, and... Uh, trying to uncover its meaning. We'll talk all about that and the biography of Alex Colville here, a really interesting fellow and um, one, of the, one of the great artists of all time, fit for our master study. So let's get right into it. Let's look at the plan for today's episode. Of course, if you're watching it after it aired, you can just jump to the timestamps down below, but you can, uh, if you're watching it live, this is what we're going to be doing here. We're going to get the image onto the canvas, doing an image transfer. I'll show you how to do that and where to find the image. Then we're going to stain it. Then we're going to talk about Colville's life and art, look at a bunch of his images. Do we do ooh, underpainting with this guy? This one's... This one's, uh, well, let's tackle that bridge. <laughs> There's going to be some back and forth between background and foreground, finishing touches side by side. This is a detailed painting, and the technique that Colville used is a bit time-consuming. So, I mean, if I can get this done in five hours or less, I'm going to be celebrating. So it's going to be a longer one, so I, I, it doesn't surprise me if people don't watch it from beginning to end. You skip around. Because some of the stuff that we'll do is sort of um, uh, repetitive, to say the least, right? Um, but I'm so excited. This one is, you know, such an important painting. And I've just loved this painting since I was a little kid, as I'm not the only one, obviously. But anyway, uh, before we move on here, just to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, especially if you're new. About 60 to 70% of the people that watch these videos are not subscribers. Um, so that would be awesome if all those people who are watching right now hit the subscribe button. That would that would uh, help the channel out big time. Matt, that way I could do an episode every single day rather than once a week. Uh, take a photograph of the painting you created. Join our Facebook group, the link's down below, upload your work, and then I think it's next weekend, I'm doing a free feedback episode where I go through all the work on the Facebook, including the the, peop the drawings people did from the free drawing course I, I did here on YouTube, which is still available, and lots of people have been doing that. Um, uh, I'll take a look at your drawings and give free feedback. So if you want to support my efforts here and uh, to continue these uh, these episodes, please consider leaving a donation as little as a dollar through PayPal, through the Super Chat here on YouTube, or contact me via my email where you can send an e-transfer or you know, good old-fashioned letter in the mail if that was something you wanted. Look at the chat. There's people from Indiana. There's Don from Indiana. There's... Not Ashley says hi. Pascaline says hello from the UK. Tempera says hello from Taiwan. Paula's uh, in Edmonton, I believe. Deborah from Gatineau, Quebec. And Mary's stuff is hi from the UK. So from all over the world, come here. People have come to make a painting. So let's get right into it. Our first step is to do our image transfer so um, we could draw this out but again this is maybe a fairly complex illustration so to simplify your lives um, there's a link to a dropbox folder in the description below you click on that dropbox folder and you're going to see at the very top these are the resources for the first few intro to painting episodes like the supply guide and color wheel and all that kind of stuff and then the next uh, i don't know 50 folders here that are letter based these are our more introductory paintings 
So we have some, some ones that should be a lot easier for a beginner painter. And then as we scroll down, there's some much, well, I wouldn't say, some of them are much more complicated. Some of them are maybe miscategorized and should be up above. Uh, one of these days, I'll do a complete reorganization of this. Um, but we are all the way down here. How far did we are? There, folder 161. And inside this folder, here's the original painting and then two versions of the outline. So there's the original, and then there's the outline. You can download that outline as a JPEG or a PDF, print it on your inkjet, laser jet printer at home, take it to a you know a local print shop or at your office, work, etc. And then you can print it on whatever kind of paper you like, and now you've got the outline. So what do we do with that outline? Well, we are gonna transfer it onto this canvas. So you can use, you can paint onto watercolor paper or uh, plywood, uh, glass, plexiglass, newsprint, whatever you want to use. But I like to use these um, uh, nine by 12 sized canvas panel or canvas board. Um, and these ones are ordered off of Amazon. I think they, they basically come out to $2 a piece. You buy like 20 of them at a time or something for 50 bucks and they come wrapped in plastic and then I take the plastic off I give it a little light sanding and then I apply some white acrylic gesso on top of that let that dry overnight and then I sand it again and that gives me a nice smooth surface now again you could just use a, a, um, a, a panel like Luan or something like they use for like your door, right? And you could get it nice and smooth or paper. Uh, but if you like painting on canvas and you want to use a canvas uh, as a support, uh, putting extra coats of gesso and sanding it is going to give you a nice smooth surface. And when we're doing a painting like this with a lot of detail, if you're just painting on one of these right out of the plastic, it's probably going to drive you bonkers because getting all of those... All of that stuff in there is just, it's basically, would be basically not impossible, but you know, it's the, uh, I often talk about the, the difference between painting or buttering a waffle versus a pancake. So if you can imagine trying to draw a straight line over top of a waffle versus drawing a straight line over top of a pancake. Well, it'd be a lot easier to draw, not, I don't know why you'd want to do either of those, but it'd be a lot easier to draw a line on a pancake than it would be to do it on a waffle, right? Because you got to go up and down and up and down. Um, and never mind the fact that the butter and the syrup are just going to gunk up your pen and you're just going to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why did I listen to that guy on YouTube? Um, okay, so <laughs> here's, um, I've just taped this, the template down, and now I'm going to use some um, graphite transfer paper. Now this says carbon transfer paper. It's actually the same thing. I've just been using the, well, it's not the same thing, but it does the same thing. I've just been using that same folder for the past few years. And this actually is double side. This actually might be carbon transfer paper now that I think about it. Um because it's double-sided, not that carbon paper is always double-sided, but it sometimes is. I'm going to move that off to the side. Okay. So, and Deborah says, cool glasses. I, I usually wear my contacts, um, but my prescription just changed, and I don't have new contacts. I, these are brand new glasses but I don't have brand new contacts. Or, well, they did give me a new set of contacts at the optometrist to test out, but I just haven't put them in because I've got, like, uh, four or five sets of disposable contacts remaining to use up, so I kind of want to do that rather than just throw them in the trash. Okay, so... That just allowed me to get the background line straight in the background. Um, so. 
So my my inner dialogue at this moment is how much detail do I want to put into this outline because so much of it's going to get covered. I mean, I, my, in the past, I might have just done this very quickly just to kind of get it done with. But I worry that that might cause me some troubles later on. So I might just take a chill pill, buckle up, and do all the work. Yeah, obviously we could just hand draw all of this. It's, it's not a problem. It's just that having these lines drawn out. You know, this, this just saves a lot of time sketching these out. In fact, let's do... And even after having done this, I imagine there'll still be a bit of mental confusion at some point. Um, at least in my own tiny head. Because, you know, this, this is, to preserve these lines like this won't be easy. We'll have to kind of paint kind of thin. And I haven't really, I mean, I've looked at um, Alexander Colville's working methods. So I have an idea how he did this painting. Uh, and I generally try to hew as close as possible to the original artist's style and technique. Um, but he's painting on a larger sized canvas. And so sometimes we have to kind of alter things in order to get something that's moderately successful, right? So once these lines start getting further and further back, they're just going to start to turn into... Um, kind of a, a just a, a mess of of lines so just kind of keeping that in mind because there's no way I'm going to be doing able to do all of this as tiny individual lines back here so now I'm just gonna And I'll show you what I've done here shortly. All right, so all these lines, oh, carbon paper wasn't there. a bit.
almost done here. Just a couple more horse legs. Oh, I also <laughs> fell down a bit of a rabbit hole of uh, research on this project and uh, the the inclusion of this painting in Stanley Kubrick's famous horror movie, The Shining. Although I don't think this movie actually made it into the final cut. I think it's in a deleted scene. But I did not realize the number of Canadian artworks in that movie. Very interesting. So I'll show you some websites about that. Uh, there is a great documentary um, about the various different, I, I don't know if you call them conspiracy theories with that movie, but okay, I think good enough, right, just before I tear that off, just double checking that all that I need is there Uh, just since this is popping out, just as a reminder, you can get white and yellow and green colored uh, carbon paper or graphite paper should you ever want it. And probably most easily you can find that at your local fabrics shop. Okay, so looking good. Let's move on to the next step here. Now that we've got our image on the canvas, we want to stain it with a little bit of color. And maybe before I talk about how I'm going to do this process, the, the priming layer, uh, let's just sort of take a look at the kinds of paint that I'm going to use for this painting. So that we're all on the same page and that if you wanted, you could go out and buy the exact same stuff. So I'm going to use what's called a split primary palette. That's the name of how uh, the colors are selected and organized on the palette. And essentially what that means is we take the so-called three primary colors and we split them into two so that we've got a warm color, warm yellow, and a warm, or sorry, kind of like a warm yellow and a cool yellow, cool red and a warm blue, and a cool blue and a warm blue. Just trying to get them all on the same side, but um, and then also using a bit of white. Now we could use black, but we can also make our own black by mixing colors together, and that's what we're going to do. Here's the recipe, but we'll talk about it as we go. So the paints that I'm using here are these Amsterdam, uh, the standard series. Now I'm not paid by the by Amsterdam. I'm not sponsored by them. No one's given me a drop of free paint or anything, uh, which is why supporting the channel is always. I'm so grateful for those of you who've done so, uh, so that I can keep this uh, as unbiased uh, as possible. Um, I'm just going to squeeze some of this paint out onto the palette while I'm doing this. Now, if you don't have Amsterdam paint, have no fret. This is the color I'm going to use for the background or for the imprimatur. Is this Azo Yellow Deep? Um, now, if you don't have either of, uh, you don't have Amsterdam paint, well, you could use Golden, Liquitex, Windsor Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supplies, Buzz. Pebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Favacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, but my, well, Museum Color, I think, in a pinch. And some of those other, many of these other colors have, are, aren't going to be perfect because your student grade paint has more, um, what we call like a binder, which keeps the paint together, right? Because all paint is basically pigment and some sort of glue that keeps the paint uh, 
it makes it stick to the surface otherwise it would just blow off like glitter so uh, there's lots of different mediums but in acrylic it's uh, basically a pl it's like a white glue that turns to a plastic when it's dry and um, anyway one thing that the paint companies often do is put a little extra um, titanium white into the mixture to make it last a little bit longer and that's kind of frustrating because it makes it really hard to make a pure black everything always turns out a little bit gray and some paint companies are a little bit uh, rely a little more heavily on that strategy than others as a cost-saving measure But, um, you know, th technically the, this paint, Amsterdam paint, is a student-grade paint, so technically it's a cheaper um, paint. I think it's the best paint in terms of quality to um, quantity that you can get and price, or at least here in, in Canada. It's possible that it's... Um, that there's a different, you know, where you live, you might find something cheaper. Golden would be one of the more expensive ones because they're, the, they have a higher amount of pigment to medium ratio. But most people probably are not going to notice the difference, including other artists. So you always have to, you know, I was thinking the other day, like, you know, it's like olive oil, you know, like, I mean, I remember reading articles about how like half of the olive oil in the world is fake and it's all made in a factory in China with, and you have to buy, spend five times extra to get true good olive oil. And once you taste it, there's no comparison. I mean, maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, but um, probably most people would not be able to identify the difference between them you know, or the difference between coca-cola and your generic cola from you know a grocery store kind of thing okay that looks like we got that in play just uh because i always sometimes people aren't watching to the very end this, by the way, is what I do with the extra paint at the end of every session, unless I scoop it into a jar. But this is our a version of a painting we did after Jay DeFeo, who was one of a really great artist. She was closely associated with the the beat movement, you know, like Jack Kerouac, etc. And she this is a, a very small version of this gigantic painting that she made in her apartment building in New York City, so big that they had to take a wall off the exterior and use a crane to get it out of her house. But I love just recreating this painting with all the extra paint that I have left over. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And maybe one day they'll have to get a crane to get this thing out of the house. So it would be true to form. So. Now, just a quick little thing about uh, the about this Imprimatur and why I used it and why this color. I mean, I've talked about this many times before, but as I said, the majority of people watching these videos maybe have never seen me before. So if that's you, like and subscribe right now. Um, traditionally, artists have used a color to prime the canvas, usually kind of a... a, a rusty red brownish color i like to use this warm yellow kind of by accident a few years ago i started doing this because it's by the end of the painting it's it there is a difference but it's so minimal and i really like this kind of yellow glow it kind of has like that um, golden hour look of you know like the sun just before it sets or just after it rises and um it just imbues it with kind of a a lightness uh, uh, that I really personally like, but you could also you could use green or orange, fluorescent pink, whatever you want. And many artists have done such a thing. I think it's it is if you're just a beginner painter, I think it's 
preferable to put some color down there, perhaps one of the, the main colors in the sky or something, for instance, because then if there's little gaps in between brush strokes, at least there's going to be a color there rather than just the plain, untouched white of the canvas, right? So that it, it you know, and I've used the example of, yeah, maybe at the end we cover all of this up, but it's like a, a pizza. Yeah, we put cheese all over the pizza and you can't see the delicious tomato sauce, but when you bite into it, you taste it. And same sort of thing in, an, in a painting. We might not be necessarily aware of seeing yellow, but our brain is seeing it. And it's, uh, it's influencing the way that we perceive the rest of the painting. Anyway, let's... Uh, Lolly says, I bet that uh, rose painting by Jay DeFeo weighs a ton now. Um... <laughs> uh... Awesome, Lolly. And talking about posting paintings, etc. Okay, so let's move on. Maybe I just, I just wanted, oops, where did that go? I just want to do a double check of the painting itself and just see. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel, con I mean, I don't think, I don't, I'm sure none of the artists we looked at would have put a warm yellow like this underneath. Um, I am just sort of quickly looking. I mean, there is sort of like this, I suspect there's kind of like a, maybe even an unbleached titanium color, which is sort of like, um, like a khaki brown, which is, could be either the canvas itself, like if you think of just like your canvas bag, right, that's the color of canvas, like when, when you buy it on a roll at your art supply store and stretch it over a frame. That's kind of what the color looks like. And I just, I feel like I see a bit of this color. I know he's painted like a gray over top of it, but I feel like that gray either has this color in it or it's showing through. There's still a lot of that color around. So, yeah, who knows? It's, 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 that would be really hard to say. Uh, this is the kind of thing that is so specific that, you know, probably only a five or six people on Earth would know the answer to that. And those would be um, the conservators, maybe at the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and a few other places that have Colville's work in their collection and would have a little bit of more of an understanding of materials and practices so that they can preserve that artwork. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. I think I think I'm just gonna leave. Well, do I? I I'm just thinking to myself, should I put a coat of that color over top of this right now? Maybe I should. So that way I can get... Yeah, okay. Um, hmm. Okay. So, um, one thing I've noticed with this Amsterdam paint is I think they're having really bad supply issues, or at least here in Vancouver. And I am unable to get new tubes of this paint. So I'm having to either use different brands or to um, do this. I've got like I don't know, boxes of tubes of paint where most of the paint has been used up except just this little bit left. Uh, 
And so I'm going to make a cool brown so that it fades into the background a little bit. So I'm, that's why I'm just wiping off some of that warm yellow. The a, a difference between a cool brown and a warm brown is minimal, but there is a difference. And um, kind of being mindful of that, I think, is important. So there's my warm or some cool. Let's see. Is So I'm going to use three cool colors, although mostly cool yellow and white here. And maybe I'll just have this tan uh, canvas bag here just as reference, right? So let's start out to mix this brown. I'm going to take some of my cool yellow. I'm going to put a little bit of cool red in here. So you can see far less. And then a little bit of cool blue. bit too much. Ah. Well, actually not bad, not bad. Let's now I'm going to take this white. And you could see pretty close, right? You know, I know Often I hear from people like, you make that look so easy, and you know, just getting into that ballpark. It all of this kind of stuff just comes with time. And um, so I think that's just a little bit orangey. bit too much yellow. Okay, so let's just put <laughs> Michael, how do you do such a bad job of this? Like, we all want to know how to fail as miserably as you do. <laughs> oh my goodness. See, now that's a little bit more on the greenish side. The one thing, I'm not going to get too upset because I'm going to paint this in a moment on top of this yellow surface and I'm going to mix in some matte medium which is going to make it a bit more transparent. So that yellow is going to, is going to visually, optically mix into this color even though it's... Actually, I should blow dry that first too. So that's also important to kind of keep in mind is that this color is going to look different based on the yellow underneath. Now I want to make sure that because there's a lot of white in there, making it more transparent is going to counteract that white so that it doesn't obliterate what was there. So I'm, what I'm doing here is just trying to make sure that there's no sneaky little bits of different colors that have snuck up into the to the ferrule, the, the metal part of the brush. Okay. And I'm just going to blow dry this.
Oh, oops. Sorry, I've been muted. Yeah. Thank you, Lolly, for letting me know here. I'm just going to blow dry this really quickly and mute again. Okay, there we go. And it, I think it's worth just pointing out is a few things. Look at the difference between the color when it's wet versus the color when it's dry. Also, when it's dry over top of a yellow surface. So this gives you an idea of like how that color changes when it mixes inside of our brains. Uh, because that yellow, it's like I put yellow into that mixture. So it's it definitely changed. Now, obviously, it's still different <laughs> than that. I could have put a lot more white in there and maybe even a little bit more red. But uh, obviously, all of this is going to get covered anyway. I just wanted a little bit more of a brown underneath. And I think that's going to save us a little bit of time as well. Once we kind of take a look at Colville's uh, very specific painting technique. Now that we've got the outline on the page and we've put a little bit of a stain and then even our first, uh, this kind of khaki brown color over top, let that dry. We want that as dry as possible. So while that's happening, let's talk a little bit about who Alexander Colville was and why he's such a beloved artist. So let's um, let's go up here. I, I do want to make mention that if you're um, if you really want a much more in-depth version of what I'm about to talk about, uh, the Canadian or the Art Canada Institute has is a really great resource that has you know these fairly in-depth web pages for a lot of Canada's greatest artists. Not all of them, some notable examples, including some members of the Group of Seven, which just blows my mind. But um, anyway, th there's a lot more depth in here. I might kind of pop back and forth. The, the, the Wikipedia page is obviously a little bit more um, condensed. So Alexander Colville, born David Alexander Colville in 1920, lived until the age of 92 and was very productive, even all the way up until uh, his death. 
So he lived a long, successful life. I think of Alexander Colville as probably the most successful Canadian artist post-World War II. Um, that, I mean, I'd be hard-pressed. I mean, there's lots of, obviously, millions of Canadian artists since World War II, but he's really one of the few Canadian artists that has really broken through into the mainstream and become a household name, um, just like the Group of Seven, who were of the previous generation, maybe even a slightly older than Colville, uh, you know, maybe a generation and a half before his time. So, um, a lot of people think of Alexander Colville as being a maritime artist, and it's true that he did spend the majority of his his adult life in Nova Scotia, but he was born in Toronto. His father worked um, in like bridge construction, and they were they moved around a lot uh, when when he was young. So let me see, like in here, is there some? Um, so worked in bridge construction, specifically steel work, and they moved to. Moncton, uh, Moncton, New Brunswick, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Trenton, Ontario, and then settled in Toronto, uh, where uh, the family um, eventually had the young David Alexander Colville. I'm not sure why he went by Alexander and then Alex Colville instead of David Colville, uh, but uh, that's that would be, that'd be an interesting story to, to uncover. I'm not sure why. Um, Maybe it's just he liked it, sounded better, right? I don't know. Um, so th th I think that part of kind of moving around a lot kind of became part of uh, uh, his interest in later on in life settling in one place. Because basically the last maybe 50 years of his life were all in and around uh, Wolfville, uh, Nova Scotia, where he eventually passes away. In fact, let's just take a quick look here at the map. Here you've got the eastern seaboard of the United States and Canada, and you got there's Toronto, where he eventually, uh, where he was born, um, Ottawa, the capital, and Montreal, and down here you got New York and Philadelphia, Washington, Maine, and then the area we call here in Canada the Maritimes. So here you've got Newfoundland and Labrador, which uh, up until after World War II was still a independent country, part of the, the Commonwealth and joined Canada. And here you've got New Brunswick and then Nova Scotia and the smallest province in Canada, Prince Edward Island. And... Um, if you've never visited, even there's a lot of Canadians that have never visited uh, the Maritimes, and highly recommended. It's very different kind of pace of life. It reminds me a lot more of like Vancouver Island, uh, like Victoria, where you know I think it's just like island life is all, everything's always runs just a little bit slower, and life is just a little bit less hectic. And that was one of the things, one of the reasons why he wanted to live in Nova Scotia is he liked the the kind of quiet peace that he was able to find there. So he becomes very closely identified with Acadia University, which is here in Wolfville. So um, let me see, where's uh, probably if you you may have heard of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Halifax and a lot of other maritime cities kind of achieved uh, some notoriety after 9/11, the the attack on New York City and Washington, when a lot when hundreds and hundreds of airplanes were diverted to the Maritimes to to Halifax and St. Johns and St. Johns. <laughs> There's two major cities in eastern Canada with the same name, different spelling, and different origin, but uh, it's just like for a while we had two football teams with the same <laughs> same name in a league with six teams. Um, Moncton, New Brunswick also. But anyway, I, I, I love, the, I mean, 
I've, I've haven't spent that much time there, but I've, I once took a train all the way from Vancouver to Halifax, which is an amazing experience. Anyway, I'm, we're not talking about that, Michael. We're talking about Alexander Colville. Let's get on track. Uh, so, um, what else do we want to mention here? Oh, um, so when he was young, let's see if we could find the at what age. So upon their arrival in Nova Scotia, which is um, at age seven, so they move from Toronto to Nova Scotia, and almost immediately Alexander Colville contracts pneumonia, which you know back in the days before there were vaccines and and um, 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 you know uh, not, uh, antibiotics, that was you know was very you know, had, was life threatening. It would kill people all the time, and so the the kind of main way for someone to recover from pneumonia was to basically stay in bed until you're better. And so he spends, I think he says six months by himself in bed. And of course, people can't come and visit you. You basically leave school and spends six months in bed. So to help him get through that very lonely period of his life, his mother brings him books and art supplies and he kind of teaches himself how to draw while he's in bed and um, and he says I stress this business of having pneumonia and almost dying because I think it had an effect on me (laughs) you think right in addition I was lifted out of association with my friends and schoolmates all through that spring and summer I led an almost solitary life in this period I became what we usually call an introvert one whose life is essentially a kind of inner life. I began to read, and really for the first time, I did quite a few drawings, simply because I was alone and I had to find something to do. The drawings I made were all of machines, without exception. I drew cars, boats, airplanes, and things like that. So kind of typical uh, boy life, you know, obsessed with trains and boats and airplanes. But we do see those same sort of elements figure into a lot of his work going forward there there are these sort of mechanical um presences including in today's painting that you know might have been just holdovers from his childhood or he might have seen them as metaphors for uh the industrialization of the of canada and the world and the pace of life changing etc because that kind of is a little bit different than a lot of prior artists. A lot of artists um, kind of go out of their way to, um, you know, often if they're going to paint like landscapes that they're often painted, you know, out in the countryside, kind of like these paintings he made when he's just 20 years old, you know, and here's one he made when he's 15 years old. So, you know, that that's very typical, right? And he was living in a very beautiful area of the world, right? These beautiful coastlines, uh, where there's a long tradition of maritime art, obviously, in the Maritimes. Um, but his sort of choice to incorporate these mechanical, this mechanical subject matter is, is I think, worthy of sort of um, bookmarking, I suppose. So he uh, begins attending school at uh, at um, why do I yeah Mount Allison University, and while he's there, he studies with a number of of uh, of well known artists at the time. I would say kind of famous artists like Sarah Hart and Stanley Royal um, are are known in Canadian art, but they're they are kind of. Um, lesser known figures today at the time nova scotia particularly the school that becomes known as the nova scotia college of art and design nascad uh, becomes you know in the 60s and 70s one of the most important art schools in the world certainly in north america Um, but around this time um, you have uh, it's it's a kind of a smaller community and fairly conservative approach. The the main kind of art style in the 1940s in Canada um, is post-impressionism and impressionism. 
um, which is which is Canada's has you know historically been a little bit behind the the uh, the trends when it comes to art. So during the 1910s, 20s, 30s in Europe, in North and in in the United States, you have things like cubism and then surrealism and then abstract expressionism are all kind of there's these successive waves of of modern avant-garde art there's not a lot of that happening in canada there's obviously in small instances of it but for the most part it's kind of canada was much slower to adopt those types of um movements and if they did it would be often those artists would end up leaving canada and going to europe or to the united states because they just felt like there's no way on earth i'm i could be successful when you know there's just really no support for this type of work so anyway um he the this the the education that he had was was fairly conservative but also i mean conservative for its time although if if he had gone if we sort of just transplanted that to like the 1880s it would have been very revolutionary right the idea of teaching uh, plein air painting was would have been anathema to the way things were done in the 1880s in Canada which was a much more very academic training uh, now we have kind of a still academic training, but focusing on kind of impressionist techniques. And one of the big things is this idea of painting outside in nature. And it's interesting that um, Alexander Colville does do a little bit of that. But as he goes on, his work becomes more and more stylized, more and more detailed. And it's not something that could be painted in an hour standing overlooking a, uh, the ocean but has to be done in a studio over weeks and months so that potentially sort of his own reaction to the, the the education he had which is often the way it goes students kind of uh um uh you know do exactly the opposite of their teachers right that's often kind of a bit of the history of art is this and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Uh, you told me I couldn't do that, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, oh, I love this quote here. Alexander Colville says, so he's talking to Royal, one of his, uh, his major mentors. Uh, and then I asked him if he thought that if I became an artist, would I be poor and have a terrible time? Fortunately, he said that I didn't that he didn't think that would happen. I think I decided virtually that same day that I would be an artist. <laughs> that's funny because that's I've had you know, he was 17 years old, you know, when he was you know, he was a high school student. He's thinking about going to university to study art. He asked his teacher, "Am I going to be a starving artist?" The teacher like, "No, you're going to do fine. You're going to do really great." So then he decides to become an artist. <laughs> Um, and to be fair, he did do very well. As his career progressed, his work became quite successful, and especially towards the end of his life, where by the, especially you know by the 1960s, 70s, Alexander Colville is you know uh, uh, art royalty in Canada. It's him and his wife Rhonda. Uh, I should mention he so he gets married. In, I think in 1940, or, well, so he meets the woman that becomes his wife in 1938. There are students together in the same classes at uh, Mount Allison University, um, but they don't get married for uh, another until August 1942. So there's this kind of long courtship process, and she says kind of some sweet things here about him and. How you know they were? They would kind of spend time together, and then one day they they're walking in the cold, and he grabs her hand across the street, and she says, "That was quite a thrill. Can you imagine that? I think maybe that was the beginning of the end of our platonic friendship." Oh, that's so sweet, so romantic. Followed by him enlisting um, in uh, the the Canadian Army, right? So. So much for a honeymoon, because 
shortly after uh, that, he is deployed to Europe. He he spends um, time. He doesn't really see action until towards the end of the war. Uh, and one of the things he's really interested in is documenting the the um, the movement of troops, of the the preparedness, like how how Canada as a country is is shipping and supplying the soldiers. So he makes lots of paintings of of boats and tanks being loaded onto boats and airplanes in the cargo hold and people in factories. And once they get to England, the training in the fields. So right here's um, convoy in Yorkshire here, kind of the rolling hills and people in training, that kind of stuff. Uh, he was not one of the first people to land uh, on the beaches of Normandy during um, D-Day, but he is there shortly thereafter. And he sort of makes a conscious decision as a war artist, as a official Canadian war artist. He begins the war not as a war artist, but eventually um, earns that uh, that title, which incidentally was some a program I w was uh, uh, honored to be a part of um, as a civilian, unlike... Alexander Colville, who was part of the War Arts Program when, at the time, you were an enlisted soldier. Um, so, an amazing program. I, I'm, that's If you go on my website and you, you see pictures of me flying around in a fighter jet plane or at the North Pole, that's because of the War Arts Program. Both t opportunities I had to spend time with the men and women in the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, specifically the Royal Canadian Air Force, but that's a topic for a different discussion. So here, so one of the things he's often doing is rather than documenting like the battlefield, it's like the 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 everything leading up to the battlefield. And there's a few of like the the, the aftermath, but there were other artists, especially Canadian artists in World War One, like Frederick Varley and A. Y. Jackson, who were also uh, Canadian War artists and Group of Seven members, who. That was kind of their thing, often documenting the destroyed trenches and villages. Um, so here's after the war. One thing I think is interesting is, you know, his style is very illustrative. It reminds me a lot of the, uh, the like, Andrew Wythe and, and the various different Wythe sons, uh, which... Uh, Andrew Wythe, very famous for his painting, is it Molly's World? Anyway, uh, <laughs> today I feel very <laughs> distracted, but I love the, it's just the, the, there's a, his style is, um, if we can see some of it, like in a painting like this, the way that he's painting is, is his own kind of version of pointillism. We did a pointillist painting when we looked at the we did the Eiffel Tower by Georges Seurat, and this pointillism is literally making hundreds, thousands of tiny little dots that together form a picture. Alexander Colville's style is similar to that, but even more interlaced dots and less of um, contrasting colors side by side. So whereas the pointillist might put yellow and red dots side by side in order to create the illusion of purple, rather than mixing a purple, you're putting those two colors side by side and interweaving them. Here, Alexander Colville is a lot more subtle with his application of paint. There still is contrasts of color, but they're not quite as dramatic as uh, those artists uh, in, the, like, post i mean pointillism is is like a late impressionist post impressionist uh approach to painting from let's you know 18 late 1880s kind of thing and really that technique didn't last that long there was a few artists that used it but it kind of because it's so time consuming not many people continued to use it but here you can really see the the amount of work that would go into something like this. Let's 
you know, hundreds of thousands of tiny little brush strokes. So that's in my mind about today's painting. I'm like, do we really, are we really going to paint this with that many little dots? Um, another painting. So it's interesting just sort of reading about him. He talks about, um, he made this painting just a few days after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And he's, he, uh, sort of talks about, you know, I'm not even really sure why I made this painting in response to that, but I just saw this like black stallion running, you know, without uh, a rider about to go through the fence on its own is somehow, I mean, maybe I should just, let's just look <laughs> at the way he talks about this, because uh, I just kind of thought it was kind of fascinating. Um, I did this painting a few months after the assassination of President Kennedy. It's curious how one's mind gets filled up with images, but I recall watching the funeral, as I suppose many people did, with great interest and being impressed with the black riderless horse, and I suppose that this has some kind of crazy connection with my having done the painting. Huh. I did not know in the funeral procession for JFK there was a black riderless horse. Oh, is that what... Okay, so that's what this painting is. Okay, I did not. Okay, interesting. You learn something new every day. Uh, what else do I want to do here? I mean, I think a lot of his painting, you know, um, as I said, there's a... It reminds me of the... Uh, it, it reminds me of, like, illustration very detailed, less expressive. Other artists that uh, I think of like Alex Katz, like a great American painter who's still alive, I be hopefully believe so, who's also would be in his 90s or so now. Uh, Alex Katz, we, we did an Alex Katz painting about three years ago, and has a very similar sort of um, t approach to paint. I don't even know how to describe uh, the 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 smoothness, the lack of detail in some ways. Uh, it also reminds me a lot of the surrealists, like Giorgio de Chirico. Um, there was a lot of the surrealists used that particular kind of um, like a uh, lack of of uh, of. What do you call it? Like, like on a font, there's serifs, you know, like on a, on the New York Times, and then versus like an Arial or Helvetica font that has that is much cleaner and simplified. So it's interesting that Colville uses this very time-consuming approach to paint things in a that are have been simplified, like these sort of platonic forms, the, these essential forms. I should also say, so just we're we're just looking at a f couple of images of World War II here. One of the things that um, he was amongst the first people to go into the concentration camp at uh, Bergen-Belsen in Germany, which was one of the most horrific places on earth. It is. In, and so he made a number of paintings of the 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 people that um, the Jewish people that had been murdered there, and but there's a, I just want to find a quote because of course people have said that um, oops that his work was was really. Uh, transformed by that experience and the, the horror of war kind of in, affected him. And he kind of has a different take on that. Okay. Um, um, so here, author and curator Tom Smartin in his book Alex Colville Return makes much of the trauma of the war and reads into Colville's painting as a response to horror. Quote, when Colville entered the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp at the end of the war, his artistic sensibility was fixed, 
petrified by the defining moment of witnessing mass graves. Whether the distance from Bergen-Belsen is measured in days or years or half a lifetime, the vividness of experience continues to haunt Colville's work. Uh, but Colville himself had a very different impact. He says um, that the visual testimony of the horrors of war was overemphasized. Resisting any characterization as a victim, he continued, The war had a profound effect on me, but it was all about the action of war. All my instincts as a kid were toward action, and war is action to the nth, nth degree. It's amazing, in a sense, how tough people are. I wasn't sickened or horrified by anything. Although, speaking of the, the Bergen-Belsen here, it was kind of chilling. I remember the grave with 7,000 bodies in it and so on, still open. It was pretty terrible business. I, it's hard to believe that something like that wouldn't deeply affect a person. Um, anyway, after the war, he, he is offered a teaching position at, um, uh, at Acadia University. And he ends up spending really the remainder of his life at Acadia University. He, he teaches there um, and uh, raises a family. They end up having four children there. Um, and... Uh, I don't know where it is. He just talks about the 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 quietness of that space and and how he, he, that really gave him some time to focus on his work. And um, anyway, there's I mean there's so much stuff here. He's such an interesting fellow. Let's just sort of quickly look at kind of an overview of some of these paintings. Um, that's a very famous painting. Let's just see. Um, And so almost all of these women that were some of them are have a little bit of nudity in there. So I'm trying to go. <laughs> I don't want to linger on them too long um, for people who may be easily offended. But um, all of those women are, or at least the vast majority of them are his wife Rhonda that appears in many of his paintings. So this is also a very famous painting of his. And where's the other one here? Oh, that makes it really small. Hey, this uh, this one here of this couple kissing goodbye is also um, really important. Uh, uh, I do want to just, before we, we move on, so he eventually passes away at age 92, obviously, after a long, um, very successful life. He, he's, you know, uh, given all sorts of accolades he had exhibited many of the big museums or at least in canada and you know he represented canada at the venice biennale in 1966 uh, but today's painting why one of the reasons it's so famous is that it's first of all it's such a a striking image of a horse running directly towards a speeding locomotive right so obviously there's we are moments away from some horrible, tragic impact. And the likelihood is, is that one of these two figures, either the, this, the horse, which represents nature, or, um, you know, it's like David and Goliath versus this mechanical uh, monster racing towards it, it's likely that one of them is not going to come out of this encounter um, unscathed, and probably the train is the one that's going to outlive the horse. So, the, there's this there's a poetry in this painting in that um, it sort of represents like someone, an individual going up against this, you know, overwhelming force that uh you know of which there may not be any hope of of victory or success and yet one does it anyway right because one maybe f is feels uh motivated to um, take on such a kind of uh challenge um people talk about the the you know nature and the natural world 
and the the destructive capacity of man-made objects, machines, pollution, etc., and how um, you know the 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 things that that us humans are doing or is impacting the the natural environment around us. I've heard people talking about this as being an allegory for dreams and waking life, like the horse being kind of our you know uh, subconscious or dreaming world and then the train being the brutal reality that awaits us when our eyes open in the morning uh, so again it's a kind of painting that one can see a lot in that as i said people have written theses and um, books and, and about it it's it's inspired by a poem by a south african author roy campbell who did a sort of a, a book tour across north america in 1953 and this one line of a poem um, i scorn the goose step of their massed attack and fight with my guitar slung on my back against a regimen i oppose a brain and a dark horse against an armored train Right, so here, you know, probably talking about uh, World War II, an experience both of these men had found themselves in, and uh, the um, the sort of moral imperative to stand up against what at the time seemed like, you know, terrible odds. This this horrible evil force that was um, just gobbling up countries and people as it went went along. Uh, so here's just a few of the sketches from his initial ideas of that image. Uh, he did a bunch of drawings of horses during the war, of course, because that was one of the kind of things that was probably most common, not most common, but one often saw in World War One, particularly in World War Two, is just the effect the war had on farm animals and the animals that were used to pull uh, cannons and infantry and all sorts of things and so it wasn't uncommon f to see that kind of stuff dead animals on the side of the road back in the day okay oh lastly just for fun just before we move on i do want to just uh point out the this uh I, not, I, I, wild connection to the probably the greatest horror film of all time, The Shining, from I think 1984, directed by Stanley Kubrick, which is a fantastic movie starring Jack Nicholson. Or 1980, it was released. Sorry. Um, and what is wild about this movie is there are a ton of well, there's a lot of paintings that are happen. Uh, that we see in the background of the movie. I've watched this movie a dozen times, and I never, it never even occurred to me to pay attention to the to the paintings in the background. But uh, the internet being the internet, there's certainly been a few people that have paid attention. Here's this website here, Eyes Scream Two Three Seven. Two Three Seven is significant because it's the room that um, a bunch of scary stuff happens in in the the hotel that the movie takes place inside of the overlook hotel and there's a great documentary i think it's called room 237 but it just talks about all the wild i don't know interpretations or conspiracy theories people have developed regarding this um movie i mean some people say it's it's uh uh Stanley Kubrick, the directors, that he may have been the creative force behind faking the moon landings, and that he was hired by the CIA to create a film that that uh, could convince people of people landing on the moon, and that he, by using in this movie The Shining, is doing everything he can to um, uh, disclose that information without in, indirectly so that he doesn't uh, get himself killed or something people saying it's all an allegory for the way that settlers um, uh, the genocide committed against Native Americans in the expansion of uh, North American you know settler culture uh, I mean it goes on and on but anyway someone is tracked down and the majority of the paintings in this 
that feature in the film in the backgrounds are by Canadian artists. Many of them, group of seven members. Um, there are a couple of indigenous artists like, um, uh, well, let's just scroll through here real quick. So here's some paintings by J.H. MacDonald. Um, here's Cornelius Craighoff, both artists that we've, we've already painted in the past. Did full episodes on this here. We've got uh, Bruegel. There's Tom Thompson. There's Frederick Varley. Another uh, A.Y. Jackson. Um, oh, Norval, Norval, blah, blah, Norval Morisot. Right. So it's, I mean, all these are all like very important Canadian paintings. So it's interesting that he decided to fill this, this. Um, movie up with all these important Canadian artworks uh, and we could just keep on scrolling down here but there is a whole page devoted here on this website to the horse and train that we're looking at in this uh, I believe deleted scene where there's a uh, a doctor who's meeting with the the young boy and the mother the, the wife of the, the of Jack Nicholson and in the background, there is this painting, uh, the the painting we're about to do today, and that there's a very specific significance to that, the, the, the symbolic significance here of which this guy wrote all sorts of stuff. I mean, it is so wild. I was reading, I'm like, what on earth are we talking about? He's done all these things where he's taking the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie overlapping them so that we see both frames simultaneously and they're moving towards the middle and and oh would you look at how that frame at you know towards the end of the movie overlaps this one and near the beginning of the movie and how these things line up i mean i don't know that seems pretty far-fetched but um if you're into that kind of thing you can certainly find <laughs> lots of information about it um okay I think um, well, he says, Michael, you should do a class on one of your paintings and you can show and tell us more about some of your cool adventures, your fighter jet painting and all that. That'd be superbly interesting. One day? <laughs> um, well, as I'm, as I'm thinking about it, I have to think about how we would we'd go about something like that, for sure. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so how do we want to approach this painting? Do we want to do an underpainting? So underpainting means different things to different artists, just as imprimatur might. Some artists combine the two uh, different uh, techniques into one um, step uh, by just sort of using staining the areas as like an outline, as maybe as they're drawing into the surface. This is a kind of painting that, that could benefit from that for sure. The one thing I think about is that's going to take me a lot of time, and I'll probably have to go back over many of those lines again. So is that really something I want to start doing right now? Or do I want to just go right to painting? Okay, so the benefits of doing the outline right now, of doing an underpainting, would be that um, I'd have there'd be less of a chance of me losing details underneath subsequent areas of paint. So the level of accuracy would ideally stay relatively high. Um, the the downside of doing all of that is, it's going to take a long time, and I'm probably going to have to do it again, or, or at least some of that, towards the end of the painting. So I really, do I want to do the same thing twice? That would be kind of, that's a lot of work, a lot of very detailed work to have to do twice. So, 
the alternative to that would be just to start painting and to maybe do just try to be a little bit more careful as I'm painting in certain areas than than I might otherwise be and I guess the, as I'm thinking about this you know when we think about how Alexander Colville painted a painting like this this whole painting it, it's painted in a pointillist approach so we have hundreds of thousands of tiny little brush strokes here we have hundreds of thousands of tiny little brush strokes in the clouds and the sky and the grass and the rocks and do i want to do i want to do all of those tiny little dots on this painting it would look awesome it would take i mean i said if i could get this done in five hours i would be lucky I think, um, I think I'm going to have to, well, I could do smallish brush strokes, not quite nearly as big. Oh, goodness gracious. What is more important in this moment? To paint this painting the way Alexander Colville painted it, or to do a reasonable facsimile using a different style? Hmm. Man, oh man. Like, is that something anybody cares about? Would anybody care or notice? Because I could paint this relatively quickly if I go just big solid things of color. I mean, not relatively, it would still take me three or four hours. And from hand from like this distance, it would look very similar to a technique that if I did a pointillist approach here, which would take me twice as long, but look very similar from farther away. I think I'm gonna do kind of a bit of both. I'm gonna do a bit of both, and that's gonna mean Maybe starting with bigger brush strokes and then getting smaller. It might look a little bit more like an impressionist painting. Okay, so let's just do this. Um, as I, I'm just trying to think out loud so that people have a little bit of understanding about how this kind of process works. So since I'm going to skip over doing my underpainting or any guidelines and I'm just going to rely on the guidelines from my uh, underdrawing or the image transfer let's go right to the background and start painting some of the, the, the sky in the background here okay so let's mix up this color and especially now that I've this makes me Working in the method that I'm about to do with a little bit more of an impressionist, pointless technique is is going... This makes me happy that I've done this extra little bit of, of color on this surface. Because if there's little gaps in between my points, my dots and brush strokes, this color is going to show through a little bit. And we can even deliberately let this color show through a little bit. And potentially even make the paint a little bit transparent to to encourage this color to show through so let's mix a blue for the sky
Okay, so let's take some white. We're gonna make. We're gonna need a bunch of it. So take some white. Take a little bit of blue. I'm gonna make actually a little bit of a a gray here. So I'm taking my cool yellow, warm red, and cool blue and mixing that together. It's a little bit more, a lot more red. Obviously, I put in that mixture. So let's just balance that out. And I'm making it much more of a blue dominant gray. I'm also going to put a little bit of matte medium in here. It's going to make it a bit more transparent, just like we did with the background layer. Now that is a really, I mean, that's pretty close. Is that too gray? Let's put a bit more blue in there. We don't want it to just be I like having kind of colorful painting, so I might just amp that up just a bit. I'll take a little bit of warm blue in there just to darken it down a bit more, a little bit more blue. Okay. So how small do we want to go here so that I don't get stuck on this painting all night long? I'm going to go for a fairly small brush, but not my smallest brush. Now we do have all of these kind of clouds in the sky. That's kind of tough. Um, I think what I'm going to do is mostly kind of paint this kind of thing all the way across. And then maybe paint some clouds maybe back into and in between some of this. Just because I don't think, just in terms of the size of my brain, and I have a tiny brain, so trying to kind of keep little spaces for little clouds and stuff here is just not something I don't think I'm going to be, I'm capable of doing here. So those of you with, with gigantic brains who can... Um, play 4D chess. I admire your ability. I just uh, am not there.
one of the things that I have to try to avoid doing when I'm doing something like this is um, is just making rows of of lines. I want to try to keep this as um, kind of uh, haphazard, I suppose, as possible, so that. Um, it doesn't, so we don't get kind of strange lines in the sky. Like a, a quilt or something. So, you know, I did do some lines for the clouds, and now I'm just, they're going to be, to the, even then the smoke from the steam train, but those are all going to get obliterated here very shortly. Yeah, I feel like I'm. This is the right strategy. Like, is this going to take me longer? Yeah, but I think you know maybe one day I'll do a whole bunch of episodes where I just paint famous paintings as quickly as possible for little kids. You know, I often get emails from teachers saying. I want to use your paintings in my classroom. Is that okay? Of course, absolutely. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I teach grade seven art classes. Can I use your templates and all that stuff? I'm like, yeah, of course, absolutely. I'd then want some honor. That, um, obviously, though, like you'd have to kind of for some paintings that works really easily. And then some other paintings, you know, obviously I took the, the scenic route <laughs> to, to complete them, right? Yeah, I feel good about this. I think... It's going to take me a while. I'm going to this is one of those nights where I think I'm going to be here for till the sun comes back up. But it does allow me to feel like for you know a few hours that I can get a deeper understanding of an artist's working method. So I wonder, you know, as I'm doing this style, like, where did he pick this up? Why would he use this approach to painting these subjects? I mean, it probably has something to do like when he was in school and he's studying with some notable impressionist post-impressionist painters and they probably would have looked quite favorably at a pointillist approach right that's like i mean that is um a, you know, a method that, you know, by the time Colville's in art school in the 19, uh, late 1930s, um, has, is firmly um, established as a, um, as a way of making paintings, a, a very time-consuming, but a successful approach. So... He was prob that you know. Sometimes artists like to make their teachers happy, um, but I can also see it as, as a very much of a rejection of his 
teachers or mentors because this kind of thing takes a lot of time and you have to kind of be doing this kind of thing in a studio where you can kind of um, work on on a painting for weeks if not months it's not really the kind of thing you can set up and do outside so um, okay let's I'm a little out of focus So I think I'm gonna, let's, uh, do I want, I want to do more here on this guy, let's just. I mean, obviously I'm going to do more in the sky, but I'm just thinking, do I want to do that now? gray after all. Some more. Uh, let's mix this. Ah, too much red. this a bit more of a yellow gray You know, this painting also appears to take place at night as well, right? So, um, different, you know, so the sky is not supposed to be like a bright, sunny um, summer afternoon kind of thing, right? This is like the, the sun is maybe already set, the light of the front of the train is on. Pascal says, could we do a first version impressionistic and continue adding detail? What do you think, people? Um, first version impressionistic and continue adding. I'm not sure I know what that... Are you talking about doing two different paintings or just starting it impressionist and then... I mean, his style, yeah, has an impressionist aspects to it and then kind of diverged into his own thing. Very idiosyncratic style, which is, you know, I don't really see that many other people having ever really used this approach, to be quite frank. So I think what you're talking about is kind of the way that he, he worked. Okay, so now I'm going to try to get some of these... Kind of clouds in the sky a little bit so
So my goal here is not to cover up the blue or even the Aimpune Matura. see kind of towards the bottom there's more sky than ground or there, so there's, there's more clouds towards the horizon line now this area here is going to get kind of covered with smoke but I think from the train but I'm going to put in Let's go back to the far left here. And then maybe I'm gonna try to kind of, I'm gonna work my way from the top and then bridge down here. So I'm gonna start out with, and I'm not gonna follow the, the actual pattern above. Now here we're gonna have less gaps So we're really going to emphasize more of the clouds. So these now we're getting kind of more clumps. You know, and if you're looking at this, you're like, oh, it just looks like a big mess. I'm not really sure. It's one of those things where I think it's going to take a little bit of time for... I'm going to have to go back over the sky and then go back over the clouds, each time with maybe a slightly different color. And until that happens, I think this painting, the sky is going to look a little undefined. And so I can imagine that could be a little bit scary for some people. A feeling like this painting is kind of a little... That's why this is maybe a little bit more complicated painting. Because you sort of have to trust that it's going to work out if you follow the process. Now he was painting on a, on a larger scale. You know, this is 41 by 52 centimeters, which is, you know, about maybe two and a half times the size of this canvas. I mean, it's not a huge painting by any means, but it is larger, so. I, met, I do think, though, that probably a lot of these marks are made with brushes maybe even smaller than the brush I'm using at the moment. Even though he's painting on a larger surface.
So I basically kind of ended up just randomly putting little blobs here of paint, not too organized. I was doing a little bit more organized on the left side of the painting. I think what I want to do now, I want to go back to this color. I'm going to do a version that's maybe just got a little bit more blue in it. You can do one that's got a bit of a warmer blue. So I'm going to put this warmer blue paint closer to the top of the painting. Because that's the sky that's closest to us. So now as I do this, I'm starting to kind of just delineate a little bit more, make space for a bit more of the clouds. And I'm just doing this at random, but I'm allowing the, but now giving little spaces for the clouds. So some of them, there's allowing some of the, the, those clouds to kind of clump up a little bit. So I can, I can pretty much guarantee that this painting at one point looked similar to this. Maybe a little bit less kind of sloppy as mine is. But I wouldn't say it would have been too much more organized. Okay, now I'm going to take this other color here. It's got a little bit more cool blue into it. And so I'm going to bring that cool blue is mostly going to exist in this space in between. There's going to be a little bit above and a little bit below. because the cool blue wants to recede and the warm blue wants to advance. So I want to use my warm and cool colors to help create depth. So 
So it's okay to have a little bit of cool colors in the foreground. It's okay to have some warm colors in the background. But you kind of want the, the overall quantities of those colors to remain in certain places to help push the colors forward or backwards. Or the, the term people would used to use in the 19... Uh, 40s and 50s would be the push-pull effect of colors, warm colors advancing, cool colors receding. So let's just zoom back out. So this gives you an idea of this process um, as we develop it. I'm going to get more of my warm blue, maybe even take a bit more. Maybe I'll put a bit of this near the top. This is per, I mean, on its in on the palette, this color just looks like you know another boring grayish blue. And then you put it on the painting, you're like, whoa, that's too, too intense. It really stands out like a sore thumb. Holy smokes. I find that aspect of painting totally fascinating, how colors take on, they behave differently next to, to different colors. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to my gray. Maybe I'm going to, let's make a version here. Maybe it's got a little bit more, well, it's a lot of yellow. A little bit more yellow. So with these clouds, I kind of want them to be, right now they're a little bit vertical. I want them to be a little bit more horizontal. I mean, so I'm kind of hurrying along. I bet you, you know, Alexander Colville probably would have worked on a painting like this for several weeks at least, right? Um, <laughs> I want to try to get this done in the next four or five hours at most. 
So that's going to mean maybe my version looks a little bit more, you know, rough than his, right? And we should just expect that. A lot of that's going to get covered up with clouds. And those are going to be warmer blue and gray because they're in front of that cooler colors in the background. Excuse me. You know, I look at that and I think I I might do more. But, you know, that's taken me about 45 minutes to get that. Let's maybe move on to the grass and the gravel. And then if after having done that, that's probably another good hour. I look at the sky and feel like, oh, let's do that. I'm making good progress with time. Let's do that then. Otherwise, we could be here forever. So let's look at the the grass here. So we've got a combination of some cool greens and some warmer greens. Uh, so let's start out. I think really probably what I should do here is just mix a black. So let's take some warm red, cool blue, cool yellow. So that color looks a little bit brown, and that tells us we've got enough red. 
Maybe enough uh, yellow. We need more blue. So the reason I'm just making a black now is it's it's easier than sort of just mixing it, like just uh, making a black that's blue, and I can just take this color as needed and add it to whatever color I'm working on. take this dirty brush, take some cool yellow, a little bit of cool blue, make ourselves a green, and take this gray, it's basically just white and black that was in there. So that's not bad. It's a little bit lighter, but we're going to also darken it as well. So maybe let's put a bit more. Now, I think one thing to think about is, so the sky I painted with horizontal lines. The grass, I'm gonna use vertical lines, and that's gonna help create two different kind of spaces. It really emphasizes the difference between them. So, So my first um, attempt at these lines, you know, is going to be a little bit sloppier because most of it is going to get covered up by subsequent lines. So, you know, if I want to be a little more accurate, I can do that in the next pass when I put different colors over top. This is just sort of filling in the space.
like honestly, until, you know, I was getting today's episode ready to paint, I never really looked at Colville's technique at all. I was only really just interested in the subject matter, like the compositions, what, what it is that we're looking at. So I think probably him using this very time consuming technique is um, one way to, to differentiate himself from all the other artists working at a time. It's also something that is very easy for members of the public who don't paint to appreciate. People always tend to respond well to art that looks labor intensive. Even if people don't like the, the image itself, they'd be like, wow, I don't really like this painting, but boy, oh boy, that looks like it took a long time. And people will tend to kind of respect an artist that, that um, has that sort of blue collar work ethic. Like, well, he's just a, you know, factory worker just like me. You know, and that's definitely a legitimate strategy for an artist. There's lots of examples of that throughout art history, especially over the past hundred years, where you get that, often that criticism, my kid could do that, that tired old horse, pun intended, that is trotted out to make that uh, claim. And if you're making a painting that um, that just wears its labor on its sleeve, like a painting like this, well, it's got sort of like a built-in defense. Like you could, you know, it's like it's very, it's much harder for someone to just dismiss it as as a uh, um, as a joke or something when they look at it and go like, oh my goodness, can you see each brush stroke there has been hand painted? It must have taken this artist forever to finish it. And, you know, if you're painting, you know, like in a place like Nova Scotia, which um, you know, it's not like there's a lot of wealthy collectors, um, and there's not a lot, at least back in the day, not, not, certainly not as many artists wandering the streets as there would have been in Toronto or Montreal or New York, Berlin, Paris, for that matter, and you want to fit in with the local community and, and not be branded as just some wacko who's who's uh, doing a bunch of strange stuff in his garage this is one way to gain the the favor the respect the understanding of the so-called general population. I, I'm just riffing here, but um, I also just know from my own experiences having exhibited in all sorts of situations, in museums and art galleries and, and making public art and exhibiting things where there's, that aren't in museums and, and talking to strangers, the stuff that I've done that is, you know, wilder and more um, abstract, people just generally have a hard time um, connecting with versus the stuff where people can see the work in there. They are generally, um, those, those get very favorable responses. So, yeah, 
and I don't, um, I don't uh, have any judgment to an artist for choosing, you know, a strategy that is kind of, it kind of guarantees them a bit of, um, it has like a built-in audience. You know, everyone's got their own path and some people want to make their work more accessible for because they want to sell more work and feed their families or go on vacation more often. Some people are less interested in that and don't see, aren't so maybe dependent on the sale of their work or don't want to be dependent on the sale of their work to, to live and, and are just more content to just do whatever they want, however they want to do it. And we'll take whatever inevitable criticism in stride and don't get too adversely affected by it. It's, you know, so let's just look at that. Yeah, you know, like, as that comes together, I look at the sky and I go like, well, at the moment, if I had to walk away from the sky and not touch it again, I don't know, I could probably, that I wouldn't be too bummed about that. I think that would be fine. So, let's now take a bit more yellow and put this in this mixture. So this yellow, I'm going to, uh, now that I've got this, just like I was doing with the sky, now I'm going to start putting in kind of uh, lines to denote these different kinds of spaces coming towards us. I'm going to leave a little gap here. I mean, I almost kind of wonder if this is a little bit too saturated of a color. Oops, I got to smudge that paint down the bottom right corner.
can see some of these lines start appearing. In the grass. So this grass would be time consuming to do it the way he did it. And would have... Uh, I think probably the, the grass might have taken him the longest of anything in this painting. Okay, let's, um, I'm gonna take a bit of cool red this time. Mix this in here to give me a bit more of a brown. So all of this just creates nice nuances in these spaces. Some of it's going to kind of disappear a little bit as more paint gets in place. Okay. I think I might just leave that grass just like that for right now and just keep on moving forward. So what I want to do now is the the ground down here. So let's mix up Let's just take the same mixture. Let's take some of our uh, cool yellow and warm red. Cool blue. Actually, that um, green is, you know, it's a really dark brownish green. I think just, I might use that color. I was going to move on, but since I just inadvertently mixed that color while I've got it mixed.
Hmm, that's a little on the... Well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to use a bit of it, and then I'm going to make it a little bit more grey. And I'm going to put more of it down by the bottom right as the this is going to be closer to us. So we'd want it to be more saturated and darker. So that just means less white and less kind of mixtures of colors. So the colors are ideally more raw, less uh, diluted with other, uh, with their complementary color, which is the opposite color. still works pretty well. Let's take a bit more cool red and just turn it back into a brown. There we go. Now I was going to go for a much lighter color, um, but I think I'm going to use this color right away to start defining the, the train tracks. So let's zoom in here so that we can find uh, a good starting place for these lines. Okay. Okay, so let's let's say if I look at this hoof right here, right in between this hoof is right next to the gravel that's right in b behind here. So Okay, so let's just, before I go too much further, let's just make sure we'll just plot this out. Here's another area.
so we had the grass was vertical lines we had the sky that was horizontal lines and then the rocks are little circles little dots and again these what i'm doing here yeah very sloppy and maybe the whole the rest of this area will get sloppy too but uh, during this initial stage i don't mind kind of just filling up with little blobs that are you know misshapen and stuff So, you know, I always get a little anxious when I'm doing stuff like this that I'm going to skip a line let's, uh, and find myself with two rail ties, let's say, side by side. So, I always try to stay patient here and just continue working my way slowly out from the center. That way that I'm not... Uh, like, so, like, one of my instincts might be to start up here and work this way. And then, oh, oh no, what have I done? So I just sort of kind of keep it expanding from a point where I can uh, see where things go. Like when I began with that hoof and then branching out from there.
So obviously my little dots here are a little bit clumsy as I'm just trying to do this as quickly as humanly possible. You know, if you were making, if you were Alex Colville and you're working on this painting, you would go to probably great pains to do this carefully, and you might spend hours and hours just doing a little section of it. As part of good craftspersonship, right? But if you're impatient like me, well, you're probably going to try to cut a few corners here and just try to fill it in as quickly as possible and hope that subsequent layers do a reasonable job of covering up any kind of laziness and impatience. As I get closer to the bottom of the painting, where we're getting closer to the picture plane, to the front of the painting, if we think of a painting like a window, right? as we get closer to the bottom here, we're getting closer to the window. And things, as they get closer, they're going to appear to get bigger. slow but we're getting there right just starting to kind of define those rail ties make sure we don't have any big gobs of paint on one's forearm. Okay, so a little bit of what I was might be a bit afraid of happening is kind of developing here, where um, there's I'm kind of having a hard time reconciling the kind of the angle. Things have to come up and get straight into here.
Okay. Um. Let's go for a different version of this brown. Heidi in there says Heidi I says I love the technique and the texture. Uh, Deborah says uh, yes Heidi I love this technique. I remember that I used this technique when I was in high school. I love the painting that I did, but it it got thrown away by my parents when we moved. I must redo it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> What is it about parents throwing things away? Everyone's got a story of parents throwing things away. And I'm sure my daughter's going to have stories of her evil father who threw away the one doll that she always wanted. I think it's because, like, our daughter seems to have, you know, she's, there's a few dolls you, she's always carrying around, but then there's, a, you know, goes through a week where there's just a, those dolls no longer matter, and she's got a new doll. And then, just as quick as it arrived, it's gone again. <laughs> um, let me blow dry that. Okay, so I just I've got this uh, other brown.
So again, some of these are look a little bit sloppy. Um, but you know, again, it's one of those things where we have to kind of keep in mind, like, how much time do you want to put into this painting? How closely are you or anybody else ever going to look at this painting? And, you know, what your, your goals are for the painting. You know, if your goal is, is simply to learn this technique, well, then maybe going kind of quickly tells you all you need to know. And you can kind of do a few areas, maybe the finishing touches a little bit more carefully, and that might clean up some of the sloppiness. You know, if you're looking at it from across the room, whatever sloppiness that is there is probably going to disappear. Won't, won't be immediately visible. It may only be really perceptible from up close. And that's really, that's often the story with a lot of paintings that appear very clean and precise. Uh from across the room or or when they're reproduced in books and magazines on the internet and then you see them up close and they're like whoa look at all the drips and splatters and this is way more messy than I expected it to be which is why I always encourage people to go and see art in person there's really no substitute for seeing artwork in person you can only you know look at things for so long on your phone or computer screen, TV screen, or book or magazine. And there's only so much information that can be gathered and often that information is just flat out wrong. Or it just, it, it creates a false impression. So sometimes you just gotta go see these things in person to fully understand and appreciate So what's going to be the trickiest little part maybe of this entire painting is differentiating these two browns, the browns of the ground and the rocks and the browns of the rail ties here.
I mean, already I'm becoming quite happy with this painting. It's, you know, I'm maybe halfway done at this stage. still plenty more to do but as you know you start filling in spaces things start kind of coming together and you start feeling a little bit of hope John says, I need more HD camera. Uh, you mean you mean on on my end here? Or you need to buy yourself a new HD camera, John? I'm not I'm not sure. Like is uh, the resolution not high enough? On your screen to look at these videos. I should be streaming at 1080p, which is the the resolution below 4K. So 4K is um, you know there's now TVs with 8K, but most broadcasts are still at the in. in um, in either 1080p or 4k so even though you might have an 8k tv probably very few things can are made in that format It is possible uh, sometimes just it, based on your internet connection you might not be streaming it at full quality just because of the YouTube might downgrade the quality so it's sometimes it might be possible to watch the video after it aired and it might be at a higher quality than when it was originally broadcast. Okay. You know, that sky, you know, everything does look a little bit brighter than maybe it should be. okay you know worse comes to worse I could just put a darker glaze over top of the entire painting at the very end uh, what should we do now should I take a break from the that and do the horse Or should I try to finish 
or it get the rail ties started here. Hmm. Well, I think for the rail ties, what we need here is a, um, I'm gonna go for a more reddish brown. I'm also gonna put some warm yellow in here. Okay, so for these rail ties, I'm going to also, just like I did the sky, maybe I'm just going to start a little bit higher up here. Do these as kind of like horizontal lines.
Now this is going to kind of muddy the water a bit here and make it maybe a little bit more complicated to see what is what. And that's going to have to wait in that little bit of an ambiguous state for a little while until I can get some black in there. And So that's why it really helps to use a different mark making approach, painting approach here, to paint these horizontally, or relatively horizontal. So that you can kind of more easily differentiate the, the different spaces or different uh, compositional elements from one another. Yeah, that's, you know, before I started putting all these lines on the rail ties, it's like, ah, oh, it looks nice and clear. I can see it looks very different than the, than the background or the, the ground. And then all of a sudden you get this and it's like, whoa, okay, that's much more subtle. painting over lines. I want to paint between those lines, Michael. Okay, I think I'll paint the the tracks. Is that, so that's the tracks and the ties, right? So I have to think for a second. What is what, which one is the rail? Good idea to you know give your brush a little clean, maybe every half hour or so, so that paint you know it starts to dry up. And it just starts to creep into the metal piece here, the ferrule. And if enough time goes on and it dries, then that just starts creeping towards the tip of the bristles, right? And then eventually that brush is garbage. Okay, let's make a gray. So we'll take this black I mixed a while ago. Uh, although... 
look at this. It does look like he used almost the exact color for the rail ties as, as the... Okay, so maybe... Hmm. Uh, um, I might make it just a little bit darker. It's also, you know, when I'm ever I'm working on a painting, there's definitely times where I sometimes think like, ooh, I like the way it looks now. Ooh, and then you're know, like, ah, should I, do I really want to do more? Is it really going to get any better than this? painting as it stands right here. So, you know, as I was painting, like, here's an area where I kind of encroached on the top of the the uh, train track. That's okay. I mean, if that's the, the only place where I made a little mistake like that, that's actually pretty remarkable. So even though it's not quite the exact right color, I'm going to take a bit more black. And I'm going to go into the sign here and start kind of transitioning into the horse itself.
So I just figure since I'm right here, let's just start tackling this uh, train. So I'm having to, I kind of made a little bit of a boo-boo with the train tracks, and I'm just sort of shifting the whole train over a little bit. Okay, so I was starting to mix a gray. Let's do that again. So this is a different, the white that I'm using is not the same brand as the white that, uh, or as the rest of my colors. So it's it's much thicker. It's what we would call a heavy body acrylic. And heavy body is just, th it's thicker. It's, um, 
and so I added a little bit of matte medium, which turns it into a little bit softer of a paint. And therefore, depending on who you ask, an easier paint to work with. I mean, just depending on the process. What I think is very interesting about the, the way that Colville is painting, and I wouldn't really have thought about any of this until I started doing what I'm doing right now, is that while he's using this technique, he is... Um, you know, one of the, the kind of trademarks of Impressionism is kind of the the soft edge of it, how colors kind of and shapes bleed into one another. Like a great example is the painter Renoir and how everything is... There's a sense of, of things having kind of permeable boundaries that uh, the line between the the a body and the background is is literally blurred and here he's using a similar technique but the integrity of the shapes is maintained so you actually have Kind of, you know, you have these, this impressionist, pointillist technique, but rather than it being kind of ambiguous as to where things begin and end, it's it's actually very explicit. There's there are hard edges. And I don't know what is easier or harder to uh, to do um, I'm going to take a bit of my warm blue mix that into my gray So that up close here, as the train tracks get closer to me, I'm using warmer colors. And those warmer colors are going to give the illusion of something being closer to me. So while I can, I don't want to just rely on the geometric perspective of the train tracks to pull these, the, the, the foreground towards me, I also want to use warm and cool colors whenever possible to to really hammer that point home Right, and then as we go back here, that's going to turn into a white, but uh, let's just hold off before we get there. Let's do the opposite. Let's take some cool blue. Mix this in here. And it looks like there's
Hmm, how did mine get so crooked? <laughs> huh. Okay, well it is, but that's interesting. Sort of putting that as a bit of a placeholder. Now, since that. I think it's time to tackle our horse here. I mean, paint the horse. We don't want to actually physically tackle a horse. That would be... I have a feeling a horse would probably come out better than, than anyone who tried to physically tackle a horse. Heidi says... Um, or Deborah says, I love the sky, and then Heidi says, Hi Deborah, yes, I like the sky too. I prefer the textured feel over polished solid colors. Yeah, I mean, I could, um, that's one of those things too with the way that we do this. We can just decide at what point can we walk away? Like, do we, how refined do we want to make things? So let's move on to the horse, and then. That would be the next question is really do are we okay with the sky do we uh, we'd probably want to do maybe the clouds or not the clouds the smoke from the train um okay so the horse let's look at this horse a lot of colors in here my instinct would go be to do a dark purpley color um, so, to get a dark purple, let's, let's do this over here. Let's take our warm, uh, blue and cool red and mix these guys together. I do see purple in here, and um, so he's using purple, but he's also, um, you know, it's just, it's also good color use, What because that, um, the purple is distinct from any other color he's using here, so it's... Uh, It, it makes for, it's going it, to, it'll stand out on its own. As opposed to like if we tried to paint it with another brown or a green or a blue. Here we're using a totally distinct color. Now, the color I'm using right here, this is a very vibrant purple on its own. Just like I've done so far, I'm going to paint most of it with this color. Um, the difference being is that you know, right now it's very vibrant, and let's just see how, how it behaves here. Um, well, is that... I, I have a feeling that as it dries, especially if I'm using thicker brush strokes, it's going to appear very dark anyway. 
and then as I kind of layer over top of it I can kind of just you know subdue a little bit of that intensity so So obviously I'm doing my best to try to allow some uh, gaps in there and using a small brush helps with this. I probably, you know, if I was using a bigger brush and painting a different technique, I would not have, I would not just paint purple like this all by itself. It would be much closer to like a black, gr dark gray And notice kind of also just the way that I'm painting, how I'm kind of like carving the surface a little bit, like painting in the direction of the different uh, planes, the... So I'm also just leaving little gaps in the paint here to so that I can see where these slightly different pieces of anatomy are.
back side of my horse's butt here is getting bigger and bigger. Okay, so, <laughs> there we are, about an hour or two, uh, two and a half hours in, we're going to move to pass number two, um, Okay, we've made it all the way through the background and foreground, and um, we've got a fairly good, the painting is well established at this point. Now what we wanna do is, is do another pass on the background and uh, ideally complete the background before we move on to completing the foreground. The As we go, Ideally, progressively, there's less and less work to do on the sky and the grass and the train tracks um, and all of this hard work that we've already done um, can sometimes be enough. And so, you know, we were talking in the chat about is the sky done, you know, uh, well, let's take a look. At, at what uh, Alexander Colville did here. Um, it's obviously far more refined than mine. If I just bring these up. And the colors are also way more saturated. There's a lot more gray in there. So, do I want to mess with what I've got, though? I am tempted to do a little bit of gray in the sky, just to darken this whole thing. I mean, I could just glaze over top of that with a gray. Hmm. I mean, that's kind of antithetical to this entire process. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Let's take our white. I think I'm going to just try using a bit of this paint, this gray.
and let's just see, maybe painting over top. Maybe not everything, just a little bit, just getting rid of some of the more saturated colors. And keeping a bit of that those saturated colors there poking out underneath. So I wouldn't say like here I am fixing a mistake. I'm just now it's sort of like going and just making this a little bit more nuanced. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's always a bit of a risk whenever you go back into a part of the painting that you might have felt relatively happy with before. But, you know, one of the things people were saying in the chat is I like the kind of a little bit of the rougher texture. So I'm not eliminating that. It's not that I'm cleaning it up and getting rid of all of that. In fact, if anything, maybe I'm making it a little bit more subtle, a little bit less um, pop. And this, uh, yeah, I, I definitely, just conceptually too, I, I'm, you know, I was almost on the verge there of just doing a little bit of a glaze, a gray glaze over top of all of this. But as I said, it felt kind of a little bit antithetical to Colville's whole working method. I'm also just allowing myself to go a little bit over top of part of, let's say, the train and the, 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 the horse itself here. So what's nice about this is I'm preserving the some of those colors, the warm and, and cool colors that I was using, and just making this whole area just just way more subtle. And that's one of the things, like, if you're making a painting like Colville over a long period of time, you know, that's one of the things that you'd probably be doing is just painting and then stepping back, looking at it for hours and just maybe inviting a few friends over and like, what do you think of that sky? Do you think, do you think, do you think it's a little bit too bright? Like, yeah, okay, well, let's, what if we reduce that saturation by, like, 10%. We just make it a little bit more gray. And then it's entirely possible you do a bit of this, and then you go like, hmm, I think I want to bring a little bit of that previous color back a little bit. And you might paint a little bit of it back in a few places. 
you, you kind of create this like web of color. You could still go even darker, but and arguably should go even darker. to the gray that uh, I had for the sky here. Oh, this is... Again, I just want to bring back the more horizontal nature of these clouds. You know, I was trying to go for a roughly a similar kind of mixture. Looks like it's maybe got a little bit more white in it than the previous one. But that's okay, because we're there would be parts of these clouds that would have a bit more white. That feels good. Like, I've never really done a sky quite like this before. And I'm so it makes me super glad that I decided to go in this direction because had I just gone and painted it kind of the way I've painted skies before, I wouldn't have learned 
uh, how to do any of this. That's okay. So now what I want to do is I want to make a, a uh, oops. I want to make a warm gray for the foreground. And now these, the smoke coming off of the train is, is painted in a different style. That is not, well, the vase is kind of the pointless style. I was gonna maybe do a bit of glazing for that, but um, it's just very subtle. So anyway, let's take our, let's move to this, for sure do this right here, I guess. So the purpose of using a very different approach is that, you know, if this is a, a warm blue, it should come forward from the cooler blues that were there. Okay. We'll start this right about there. Just gonna blow dry this real quick. Okay, so I'm just thinking about the way that he's done this. He's got some, he's doing the same sort of thing that he did before, um, but some of these brush strokes are very transparent. So the question in my mind is which pr approach works best? Starting with more visible brush strokes and then getting more transparent or going transparent and building to more visible. I'm gonna go more visible. I don't think there's a difference. 
Um, but, uh, yeah. Horse's face. How much room do I got here? Start with these big clumps. Those are kind of the solid white. This would also give me an opportunity to kind of maybe slim down this horse's butt a bit. That kind of started to get bigger and bigger as I uh, was painting. So those white clouds coming up there, I think it's starting to work pretty well. You can see the distinction between the foreground and background clouds. Well, he says, i got to go to sleep now. I will check out the finished piece with all its final touches tomorrow. Thanks, Michael, for another fantastic and interesting class. Good night, everybody. Good night, Lolly. I hope you have sweet dreams tonight. Well done. Thanks for keeping me company. Okay.
let's now go to, let's take some of this paint and mix it into here, into just some white, or sorry, just clear matte medium. So the color stays the same. We're just, oops, it's not even on camera. Uh, just diluting it so it's more transparent. We'll see if this is too transparent or not in a moment here. Now this is an area where I may even want to come back to, to get this, what I really like about how these clouds, or not clouds, the smoke is sort of descends down onto the grass and gives it like that low fog kind of quality. I think it's really gorgeous. So this is appearing at the moment to be quite opaque and quite white. Um, I'm pretty confident as this starts to dry, it's gonna become much more transparent. And it's possible that in a few minutes, I won't even be able to see much of what I just painted. Which would be okay if it's actually kind of quite subtle. I think that would be a good thing. It's also likely, you know, the, this white that I painted down there to start. Oops. For the smoke, it's still probably a little bit wet. So I might be blending a little bit of that into my brush strokes which isn't necessarily a bad thing either because then I'm going to get just a little bit more of a slightly softer edge So I think I will end up having to um, maybe add more white into this after it dries. So while that's happening, and you know, maybe I kind of might have gone a bit overboard. I don't know, we'll see. I can always, well, in fact, I just wonder maybe I should, while this paint is still a little bit wet, So 
So I'm just painting a bit of my cloud color back in here. bit of the same color that I went and redid the sky with a bit. Okay, I think that was the, 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 I'm happy with the way the smoke looks right now, but I think it's one of those things that also needs a little bit of time. I need to um, get more of the painting done before I can really resolve all of that. But I feel like, you know, I'm happy with the way that looks. And it's not too dissimilar from the sky in the original painting. You know, obviously, again, he would have spent a lot longer on it than I, I have. And Deborah wishes Lolly a good night. That's so kind. I think I need to go back into the grass next. Okay. Let's take our cool blue, cool yellow. gray, or sorry, black, and then where's my white? More white. So I'm going to do a, let's see. I'm going to do a bit of painting with this color. Just sort of filling in little gaps in between here.
it's it just sort of always blows my mind that you know a color like this it's like ah oh, it's too gray it's too dark it's not kind of vibrant enough and then i look at the original I'm like oh my goodness look how bright and saturated that color is so you know alexander colville's is you know this whole pal the whole painting is very subtle right that's what makes if anything one of the most complex parts of this painting is just his incredible use of a super narrow palette like almost everything in this painting is a gray you know and and uh to the to the point where it approaches like a, a black and white photograph people are like are you kidding me look how much color is in well but just in terms of for a painter that's what we're talking about is is a very um I mean, there's it, I th and I think with all of Alex Katz's pa paintings, there's almost like a bravura, bravado, like a, look what I can do. And that's often like artists do that, like you know they they see a painting by a friend of theirs, or in a museum, or in a magazine, or they hear about it, and you know everyone's talking. Look how like just the incredible subtle use of color and then an artist goes back to their studio and was like how do i can i do something like that can i how do i possibly get that can i and so they challenge themselves to see if they can you know um top another artist or a master etc adding a lot more cool yellow into that mixture. It's not too far off the previous yellow, the kind of brightest yellow I had in this grass. But sometimes it's nice to, and it, you might feel like, oh, well, you're just wasting your time. You've already used that color. But sometimes it's nice to bring a color that you've used prior and bring it back and overlap. Um some of the colors that came afterwards. And just create like a really dense web of like in in I mean there's different thoughts about this some artists either consciously or unconsciously are trying to create a painting that is kind of very hard to reverse engineer you look at it and you're like how on earth did this did they do this to prevent somebody like me from doing exactly what I'm doing right now you know, in the same way that, you know, an iPhone, you know, they, they want to make it as difficult as possible for a competitor to just open up and make a duplicate of it. They want to, like, how can we frustrate them, slow down that process so that we have just that extra few months where we can sell this thing before the knockoffs start appearing everywhere. So I've just added now some warm yellow into this mixture, which I haven't yet used for the grass. I want to try to keep that. I need, I guess, more of it.
see like that looks pretty um you know it's that grass looks looks quite vibrant maybe a little bit too vibrant um it could be much more gray So now I'm using my warm green and I'm going to try to paint more of that. Here's just some warmer blue in the mixture. I think I might have to let this dry because I've got just keep painting wet paint into wet paint and it's just sort of the intensity of those colors are disappearing. So let's I'm gonna move on here. I just think it's interesting also, like you know, I paint this and it doesn't really show up, and then I paint it here, like, whoa, that's too dark. Whoa, my goodness. Okay, I think I'm just gonna leave the grass for right now.
one second here. Uh, there's, uh, Lisa says, I love this one. And Jules says, I started working through your beginner's drawing class a couple days ago. Thanks for making it, man. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. Thanks for saying so. Um, and, uh, yeah, take some photographs of what you've been working on. Upload them to the Facebook group so we can celebrate your work. There's a new feedback episode coming up very soon. So, um, I happy to give people suggestions on how to improve even though that that class happened years ago um, anything I can do to help encourage people to make art that's uh, that's why I'm here okay let's get back to the ground down here I mean I, I would also say like you know I look at the screen I'm like wow this grass is really that's really vibrant and then I look at mine and it looks very gray. I think, you know, because this camera, I have boosted the saturation just a little bit. I've also boosted the reds a little bit, uh, just so my hands don't look quite so pale. I mean, they're, I don't have the super pale hands, you know, so um, the colors aren't exactly 100% true to, like, I mean, by, by boost, I mean, like, 3 4%. But it still has a noticeable effect that the painting will look a little bit different on camera than it does in person so that's another thing too is i can also be confused by this grass and how bright it appears compared to what's going on down here which is totally unfinished and of course the horse and etc so um I think what I need to do is now I need to go into this. I need to really, I need to darken and then I'm gonna do a little bit of lightning. So, gonna do a bit of lightning. That sounds like a, a drug. <laughs> I'm gonna do a bit of lightning. Oof, that sounds like it would really mess you up. <laughs> Uh, this time I'm going to go to a, some, uh, well, did I do warm browns here? You know what, I mean, it's, well, hmm, yeah, let's do some warm browns. So let's take our warm yellow, a little bit of warm uh, red. And a bit of warm blue. And now I've got like a, a very orangey brown. I'm going to use that in some parts. Let's just take this and go the opposite direction, make this very blue. Let's take more red. And I think I need to, I'm going to add white and black to these mixtures. Or, or maybe I'll just do them to the side down here. Let's just see if I can add a little bit of my purple in here. to make black after all.
cool yellow. Warm red. show if I didn't, I, I just used my brush which has a lot of white, or I guess didn't think it had that much white on it, but I guess it does, obviously. So now I've just got like a gray. Um, not too bad since we're going to make it, mixing this in here anyway. Hmm, that's very purpley. Kill that purple with cool yellow. So once again, I'm kind of being a little bit sloppy of the application of this paint. Just because I've been painting for quite a while and getting a bit impatient.
Deborah saying, good night, everyone. I have an early morning coming up, and it's 11.34 p.m. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Uh, remember to like Michael's tutorials. Hugs. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. And Pokemon Daily says, me too. I, uh, I think to what Jules was saying about just started the drawing class a few days ago, and is finding it useful, which is awesome. Thank you guys for tuning in to say that. I appreciate that. Now he's spent, and I'm looking at this at the. Blah, blah, blah. As I look down at the bottom of this painting here, I can see that he would have spent some serious time on some of those rocks right at the bottom. Now, I'm not going to spend nearly that much time on this. So this is time consuming, but you know, the parts that are quote unquote done, or at least look good enough at this stage, like the grass and the sky, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy with, right? So I just have to keep, so even when I'm like working on this and I'm like, oh, I don't know, I might've lost the plot a little bit here. Um, I just keep telling myself, okay, just keep on going. Keep on going. If other places worked well using the same technique, it's it's likely, not guaranteed, but likely that this area is also gonna um, be okay. Another thing too, it's entirely possible that, you know, as I go here, that some of the details of the train tracks get a little bit obscured or even disappear entirely. And so the, you know, the question to myself is just like, 
you know, how realistically, how much time do I want to spend on this? And is it okay to walk away with a painting that's, you know, going to be a little bit different than the original? You know, if, if I was Alexander Colville and this was my painting and I was planning on exhibiting it and selling it, well, you know, I'd obviously want to ensure that it's the highest quality that I could... Uh, possibly do but I'm never gonna sell this painting I may never even exhibit it other than than in my living room so it may only really truly exist as a video here on YouTube so then I think okay well maybe maybe it's okay if it's not perfect Okay, so I'm going to add a bit more, I'm adding some white into this color, as well as a little bit of black. I'm going to make this color go a bit more gray. I'm going to try to pull those train tracks in a bit, make it scoot in. So, so this the reason I'm so this gray is just going to make the train tracks look like they're a bit further away. Now, gray works well in the background. Because gray makes things look like there, there's atmosphere, things in between it. And we can see that he's doing the same sort of thing in here. The things start just getting a little bit less distinct, a little bit more gray as we go. Let's take this gray.
Okay, so now I'm starting to kind of uh, get closer to finishing this area. So now I'm thinking about, okay, well maybe a little bit more careful application. Maybe oh, I can't even see that. Slightly more careful application of paint in this zone over here. So again, I'm kind of grateful for having done that initial uh, kind of khaki color after my input amateur because it just saves me a little bit of time. It's just one less color that I'm going to have to paint here towards the very end. I just leave a little bit of that coming through and it's like I, I had painted it there previously. I mean, when I look at, at what he's done there on the left, like, oh, just a tremendous amount of respect. I think like, wow, that's really nice. That is really beautiful. Uh, and I'm not gonna be able to do a quarter of that, so.
Okay, getting there, getting there. Let's, uh... Um, take this bit of a lighter... Almost a bit of a warm orange here. That should help separate them a little bit. Okay, now just racing ahead here. Let's just go right to our fairly dark brown black. And
I have probably almost killed this brush that I'm using. It is not happy about being used in this way. About kind of just uh, smudging and smearing and dotting and it's really putting a lot of pressure on it, so. I don't know how much of a life it has left after this. do those rail ties again. Let's take some white. This paintbrush has taken on like a severe curve.
this a bit more of a blue. So, you know, as I'm working on this, I think to myself, well, it is pretty sloppy and pretty messy. It is uh, nowhere near the level of quality of Alexander Colville's original. And that's disappointing. I mean, well, I mean, I, I could spend the next 40 hours working on this. But, you know, at some point you have to kind of say, you know what, I, uh, I'm just not going to be able to do exactly what he's going to be able to do unless I spend the same amount of time. And even then, you know, the likelihood that it's going to be as good as his is just about zero. I mean, I am a little bit tempted to use like a Posca pen to outline some of the train tracks. I might do that. I'm just gonna hold off on that for right now. Barbara says, hi, Michael. It's 5 a.m. here in sunny Bristol, United Kingdom. I just tuned in to see if you're still going. Lovely painting. I thought when I saw your choice, it would be a little dark in shade and mood. But this is fabulous. Well, <laughs> I mean, the original painting is kind of dark. Um, and that ideally, would I would go in that direction. Um... And in fact, the, the, the painting you, you see on the left uh, that I've put in the Dropbox is actually even brighter than the original. I've even brightened it up a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's, this version is not really a nighttime version of this painting any longer, right? Uh, I'm going to switch to a different brush because that one I think just wrecked so let's blow dry the the painting here and then we'll start working on the horse seriously
Okay. And Paula says, Michael, thanks a lot. I will catch the rest tomorrow, 10.30 p.m. here in Alberta. Good night. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been, we've been uh, we're at just past the five-hour mark here, so no surprise that people are saying good night here. Just notice like a big uh, raised piece of texture there. So I just thought that can cause like, you know, it might look fine from above or when it's lit like this, but if it was on the, the wall or on a shelf, we might get a really strange shadow underneath there. So, okay. I think we need to mix a big batch of black. Um, for this final stage here. Pretty good. I think I just need to put a bit more. Cool blue. So it looked a little bit brown, and so you ask yourself, okay, what is brown? Brown is really kind of like a, well, I mean, there's billions of different kinds of brown, but brown is can be thought of as a very like a, a neutral or almost neutral uh, orange and the opposite of orange on the color wheel is blue so if we can get a little bit more blue in there it'll neutralize that brown friend who wants to go to a 10 30 p.m. movie texting me here Whew, can I do that I mean like I'll say at this stage it does look a little bit messy this it would you know if I just finish the horse I think it would look sort of like a sketch that Alexander Colville could have made for his finished version of the painting which wouldn't be such a bad thing. I mean, that would be an honor if it could be, even be perceived as that, rather than kind of the finished version. I'm almost even tempted to do a different, a, you know, pass at this, where I do one painting much more quickly. Although, you know, I think I would probably end up slowing down at some point in where I am right now. Okay, let's... Look at this horse. I'll just put the horse right in the middle. did I just what was I just doing just mixing black or is any of this wet <laughs> okay let's just uh, do this okay so let's just start out with actual black and just kind of start uh, chiseling away this
So one thing that's kind of happening here is I've built up quite a lot of texture. And you know, it goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning about painting, drawing a line across a waffle. Right, that can be kind of tricky when the paint really kind of layers up and we get a lot of texture. some of this. Let's get a bit of white. This is, you know, it's so interesting. I i don't know if, you know, maybe if someone doesn't, uh, doesn't do this painting or, or doesn't paint much, but uh, might not really notice a difference. But uh, as I'm working on this, I just feel like I've never really made or painted um, in this way before. It doesn't, like, I would have approached this very differently, probably like as one big mass and then sh maybe even glazed it's a few areas here. I 
I mean, obviously, I'm just speeding through this part of the painting. Let's take a bit of brown and put this in here. So while I am painting out most of the purple, some of it's going to stay there anyway, even if I try to completely get rid of it. And that color's going to kind of just still bleach through and infuse everything with a bit more personality, so... I'm happy with, with the way it's unfolding here.
Now that needs some work, but before I maybe, well, maybe let's just take a bit of yellow. Let's take it just, just a little bit of cool red in here, even though. I mean, this is also one of those things where a hundred different artists would see these colors in here a little bit differently. And so how each person interprets it is, I think, exciting and interesting. And I think I am going to do what I rarely do, which is to bring out the black so that I can get even darker than the darkest dark. Barbara makes a great point. Such an odd perspective. The horse's butt is so big. You know, I was thinking that earlier. I was going to mention that. It is unusual, obviously, to to paint the back side of a horse. Right? And have that the horse's butt right in our face as viewers. Um, obviously, it helps create that dynamic tension where we see it moving towards the train. But there was one could easily have done the opposite, had the train charging towards the horse so that we would see the front of the horse. That would, of course, change the narrative a little bit. It might put us in the viewpoint of the train charging towards the horse, which would be you know, far more antagonistic you know that that would it's sort of like we would take on the the feeling of the the dark entity of the train about to crush 
the, the life force of this horse. And therefore, rather than being David and Goliath, the train being Goliath and, and the horse being David, it would be inverted, right? So we would be taking the point of view of this, of the train, which is the one, I think most interpretations would see the train as a negative force in this painting. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I just think it's, in, you know, um, one could do that. Um, but it would be very provocative. Like, uh, be kind of one of those things where you'd say to yourself, like, what are you, what are you trying to say here? Like, why, why do you want us to almost try to identify with that force? Now this black is very intense. It is, you know, I am a little worried about how, in, I mean, I, how dark it's coming across. It goes to show, like, you know, when I'm not using black, I'm mixing my own black, um, I don't really have to think about these sorts of things very often. Stamped a bit of paint over there. That's going to have to get cleaned up.
let's get kind of a slightly lighter black, not quite as dark. Kind of scrape away some paint here is giving texture that I'm not a big fan of and I don't know if I can or 
resolve this area sufficiently. how that leg keeps getting wider and wider.
Uh, okay, I think I gotta just uh, finish up with the train and then we'll call it a day here, so. Um, oh, Andrew says, I was wondering why he changed the perspective from his sketch that was even more directly behind the horse and it seemed more dramatic. That's true. Barbara says, to me, it portrays fear, anxiety, whether the horse will veer off in time. Barbara says, hey, Andrew, I need to look at that. I read about the artist last night. I just tuned in to the end result. Andrew says, I saw one of the pages that shows some preliminary pencil sketches and has a view from directly behind. I think he wanted the viewer to be observing from the side rather than pulled all the way into the action in the final version, perhaps. So since we're talking about this, I, I showed this earlier, but um, it's worth just sort of uh, taking another quick look at it. I'll kind of keep that up on screen there for a few minutes while I get the train. So yeah, you can see how the how he is, um, you know, the train. I mean, yeah, like the train tracks. Basically, in this viewpoint, we're we would be standing on the left rail of the train track here. Right, so a very dramatic uh, scene, but yeah, like I think um, what I was saying earlier about how uh, Colville probably didn't want a big horse butt right in your face. I think he's probably just moved it off a little bit just to make it a little bit less, uh, I don't know, potentially offensive, I suppose. here um, I'm just mixing up some black and uh, a bit of gray I'm just gonna put a bit of brown in here just so it's not just a pure black and pure gray there's just at least something of interest in here uh, because I don't want to paint the train like a pure black I think it needs to be dark but not pure dark and especially doesn't need to be as black or it shouldn't it should not be as as black as the horse because then it's sort of competing with foreground space and it's in the background so we don't want to kind of uh, elevate it to the foreground Let's put, let's put a bit of cool blue in this mixture.
Hmm, don't like that at all, so I'm just going to paint most of this that circular form out. Let's blow dry this. So let's take some warm, uh, it's actually cool yellow, let's take, take cool yellow. Cool yellow and some white. Um, uh, I think Andrew says, I think maybe he wanted the viewer to be observing from the side rather than be pulled all the way into the action in the final version, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, giving us a little bit of distance so that we're kind of, you know, observers like, oh no, what's about to happen? Rather than like, we're in it and we're about to be the, hit by the train. I think there's... Maybe that's a little bit less uh, confrontational. That's a good point. Sandju says, hey, Mikey, now I am doing your drawing courses, too. Next week, I will be on third week holiday, and I'll focus more on painting and drawing. Good job, Sandju. Yeah, that's, a, that's very cool of you to use part of your holiday to, um, to, get, uh, to explore drawing. That's awesome. Takes, that's that's a lot of um, independent effort that probably no one is making you do. So I applaud your courage to do something that you don't have to do just be, but because you want to do it. 
So what I'm, oh, let's see. What I'm doing here is I just took some glazing fluid and some of my yellow paint. I want to get the, uh, the effect of this light from the train blazing forward here. Mute this again. Now I'm adding, you know, little bits of highlights onto the um, these rail ties and stuff that aren't really there, but. As I always say, sometimes you gotta paint what's not there or, or some, <laughs> that's not what I always say what I always say is sometimes all right what I always think is sometimes you got to paint it wrong in order to get it right but I also think sometimes you know when we're doing these episodes that you sometimes you got to give yourself permission to diverge from the original and make it your own um Okay, where's my white? There's white. Taking a bit of this white and putting a bit in the clouds.
Okay. Drew says, thank you so much for introducing me to this artist, Michael. Reading about him took me on an interesting journey into the perfectionist art movement. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of, that's the whole the whole point, for sure, is um, uh, I want to be, I, these are all artists that I really like, and I want uh, to, um, I want other people to to fall in love with them as well, and um, and while doing so, maybe learn a little bit about how to paint and uh, have some fun, learn some different techniques. So what I wanted to do before I did that is let's go okay I think we're almost done here I could just continue working on this forever but I think I want to start wrapping up um, so just final little finishing touches just cleaning a few things up so I want to this uh, post back here. Let's take a little bit of blue. Let's take a little bit of gray. Where's my white area? Um, Barbara says, agreed, Andrew. I am thrilled that I can produce a drawing that resembles the subject. Or, sorry, maybe you're talking about Sanju and the drawing course. Sanju says, do you also paint using oil? Um, I used to paint exclusively in oil for... I don't know, how long was I doing that? Uh, 20 years? And uh, I haven't painted in oils in a while, mostly like since the pandemic, mostly because this is what I've been doing with my spare time. I'm illustrating a graphic novel, a comic book, and that has uh, is done in acrylic paint as well. They're, I mean, I like painting, and there's nothing against oils. I, I really like painting in oils. I think it's a totally different experience. And um, I know people ask me all the time to teach a oil painting class, but not gonna do it. Um, just because the, the audience for that is fairly small, so uh, it probably wouldn't be the best use of my time. I mean, there are people who, who obviously there's lots of people who paint in oil paint still, but fewer and fewer as the years go by.
just kind of tidying up a few places where I might have you know, got fingerprints and handprints and footprints and all sorts of prints all over the place. So, can I deal with the fact that it looks like it's daytime? Do I want to do more darker line work inside? Well, I am liking, you know, as I do a little bit of these darker lines, it is cleaning up what I perceive as a bit of sloppiness and messiness.
So I think I am going to do a little bit more here of that. Uh, just one second. I'm not going to be seeing the 10.30 p.m. movie here. So in order, rather than adding water to this black, I've put some matte medium in there. And that gives it a little bit more fluidity, which allows me to do a little bit more detail. It makes it a bit transparent, but I'm okay with that transparency because um, it's just going to make that line maybe just a little bit softer and less uh, intense. Now I'm only going to use solid black for uh, the foreground. How did I do that? I've kind of inadvertently made plain there the maybe a the problem that I didn't recognize here. Let's So I know this kind of thing takes time, and I could use my Posca... Should I just use a Posca pen? Let's just use a Posca pen. I'm going to blow dry this, though.
Hmm, great questions. Uh, Barbara says, Michael, do you ever wish you'd done the painting on a larger canvas now that it's finished? Um, when it comes to these classes, not really. I, I like the, the keeping them uh, the exact same size painting to painting. That's kind of important to me. Um, Uh, when it, so my own paintings, let me see, do I ever wish I did them a different size? Not, I, even then, not really because I always, I think to myself, okay, well, let's just take what I've learned here and make a bigger version. Um... Yeah, this is... We should zoom in and just show you kind of a little bit closer up of what I'm doing here. Maybe that's a little close. I don't know how visible that is on camera.
I think that's probably good enough. I think I can walk away at this stage. Not, I mean, it's, I could always do more. Uh, but I think that's probably good enough. I think. So. Um, oh, I see. Anrod says, Hello, Michael. Thank you for your lesson so much. It's a fortune to see you live because we have different time zones. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Nice to see you, Anrod. Thank you so much for tuning in and saying hello. Okay. So our side-by-side -side comparison. Let's take a look just... Uh, before we do so, just encourage you to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. About 70% of people who watch these videos aren't subscribers. That would help me a huge amount if you were to subscribe to the channel. Um, another thing you can do is if you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as a dollar, 25 cents through PayPal, you can use the super chat function here within YouTube. You can do an e-transfer by contacting me through my email. My email's on my website and on the Facebook page. And if you haven't joined the Facebook page, you've got to do that now. Take a photograph of the work you created, upload it to the Facebook group so that we can celebrate your achievement. And with that, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison here. And... See how they looked side by side. Now, obviously, my painting is a lot brighter. I mean, I'm almost, I've throughout the, the session been tempted to just do a dark glaze over top of everything. And I mean, I could still do it right now. Do I want to? No, I'm not going to. Um, but um, so it does have a slight oddity of having this light from the train is being bright obviously it would be much more apparent had everything else be darker do i i could darken this maybe i i will Okay, so t in order to do this little bit of a glaze, let's take our... Oh, do I have anything left here? <laughs> it's not covered in paint. Um, let's go to this here. I'm going to put a substantial amount of glazing fluid in here and then I'm just going to take oops that's a little bit much take some black and put that in here So that did really darken that area down quite dramatically.
see, that's too opaque. Let's get lots more. Hmm, that's making an improvement. I do like that it, everything's sort of just darkening down a little bit. How much more of this do I want to do here is the question. I'm going to blow... I mean, there's also the possibility of, of darkening the sky a little bit.
Like, let's just see what would happen if I did just make the sky a little bit darker. Liking how that looks. Definitely feels much later in the in the day. And which I think is a good thing. Uh, or sorry, Andrew says, the glaze is really bringing it uh, much closer in tone to the original. And Barbara says, the glaze has made the rail lines pop out. Amazing difference. Uh, um, and Kathy says, oh wow. <laughs> I'm camping and just going to my tent. You're still live. <laughs> LOL, looks great. <laughs> Okay, um, I mean, one thing, by darkening the sky, it also helped bring out the, the smoke from the train a little bit more, made that a bit more dramatic, because it was a little bit ambiguous there. Um, I think that's probably good. Okay, so now... Let's do our side-by-side -side comparison now that we've got these here. So, um, just sort of looking at that right now, I feel pretty happy. There's a, like that leg looks a little stiff and maybe there's some details here I'm not so, so happy with. But, you know, for basically six hours of work, which is not nothing, but you know, the, I, I, I guarantee you that the Alexander Colville spent weeks working on this painting. So to get anything roughly in the ballpark in such a short span of time, relative span of time, I, I feel good about that. That makes me happy. Um, maybe... Let me see little things here. Um... I want to do, where's my white?
Okay, I could just fiddle with this endlessly. As I'm sure Alex Colville probably wanted to. So let's look, uh, let's just go zoom in and just start kind of going around. Okay. Uh, you can definitely see that there's more texture to mine than his. Um, I've never seen this painting in person, so I don't know how much texture there is, but I would imagine there's f relatively little. Um, I don't mind that about how my painting turned out, though. I think it's fine. It is interesting that the this post has really no shadow there's no shadows anywhere in this painting except on the train tracks which is interesting um i mean i guess it's supposed to be at night but there would be you know still could be shadows from moonlight let's scroll let's just kind of look at maybe well let's look at the cloud here for the train Yeah, I mean, I'm happy. I think glazing was the kind of the smart idea because now I can, I really see the smoke a little bit more clear. Um, the train, I kind of ran into some problems structurally with like the, 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 the look of the front of it and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. It is what it is, but uh, and also the tracks, it's a little, you know, dicey as to how that's, sitting on those tracks but whatever it's okay um you know you could see he really darkened everything so that the those the train tracks they just pop they really glow and i could just keep painting more and more white on here as thomas kincaid would say um but uh i think it's okay Again, obviously, he's done a ton of work on those rocks. It is gorgeous. Each one of those rocks is treated a little bit differently, and we see highlights and shadows on different facets and faces, whereas mine is just clearly uh, a bunch of splotches of paint there. So that's a little disappointing on my part, but you know, the alternative would be to spend the next few weeks of my life working on this. Let's look at the train tracks. And um, I think doing a little bit of that, using the Posca pen to do some outlining helped. I mean, in an ideal world, I would paint that, but that would have just taken me an extra, I'd still be doing that. And I wouldn't have started glazing at this point yet. So <sighs> on the opposite side there, you could see in the grass, he's done a really nice little job of of having grass growing in different directions. That nuance is really beautiful. And then maybe let's just zoom back out on the horse here. I think it turned out okay. I mean, there's a lot of nuanced colors in there. Purples and magentas, blues. Uh, and he's done all, again, all those with tiny little brush marks. So mine, I kind of started to cheat here as the time was ticking away and thought, you know, I'm just gonna do some, use some bigger, wilder brush strokes and just get this thing done. Um, and, you know, there's little parts like that leg just drives me crazy. These feet. He really chose a, a fairly complicated pose for that horse. Like, if I was doing this same painting, I probably would have chosen a, um, a, a pose where each of these legs would, would be separated. So they're not kind of collide or they're not colliding with one another, but they're you know, overlapping one another directly. And that does make things just a little bit confusing. Um, he was able to pull it off, right? He's 
obviously one of the great artists of all time um me not so much <laughs> but all in all i think we got kind of the 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 point of it i think and you know as time goes on and i look at this painting on its own for what it is and not for what it isn't i think i'll be more and more um, at peace of with how this has all unfolded so um, with that i'm going to bring the show to an end thank you very much uh pascaline is in the chat there saying hello um it's 6 52 a.m here and you're still live do you have tea to keep going i've got some six hour tea that is just now a little bit chilly uh but i appreciate uh the question um doing this kind of thing makes me uh, gives me energy enough uh, there's always that anxiety it's a good anxiety of trying to do something live like this a bit of a performance so there's enough uh, adrenaline <laughs> pumping <laughs> to keep me awake throughout the whole process okay everyone enjoy the rest of your evening and week and we'll see you guys um i don't know if it's this weekend uh but uh very soon we're doing another one of those feedback episodes so get your work in um and Gokhan Gokhan says thanks for the show Michael thank you for tuning in have a great night everybody we'll see you guys on the flip side take care and with that a good night to all <laughs> Woo! my goodness that was a long one